Hey, everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live, where I sit down with amazing humans, unpack their brains with the goal of helping you. And today's guest is Gabby Bernstein. Now, you may be familiar with Gabby's work. If you're not, you're in for a treat. And if you are, I know you're going to be fast forwarding through this intro to get to the meat. But I'm going to just do a, a super short uh, intro here because Gabby's work is transformational. It works on those invisible doors that we all need to open in order to create the change that we seek in our lives. If you've ever wondered why you wake up with anxiety and how to manage it, if you've experienced some trauma that you're aware of, how do you start to take that on? Her new book here, which is called Happy Days, The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace, is an amazing path that breadcrumbs you with tools, with concepts, and with direction for your life on how to get started. I'm going to stop talking and let you get into this episode. Yours truly and Gabby Bernstein, how to guide from trauma to a fulfilled life. Gabby Bernstein, you're back. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's so good to be back with you. This is been... definitely one of my my most exciting podcasts I'm rejoining. So oh, happy to be with you. Thank you for your time and for your wisdom. Uh, we've been, as you just alluded to, we've had, had you on the show before and uh, incredibly popular episode. It's not the least of the reasons we wanted to have you back other than this new book you've got, which is called Happy Days. Uh, I'm dying to get into that. But before we do, for the you know three or five people who are listening and watching and might not be familiar with you or your work, I'd love to start out uh, these episodes with asking you to just share a little bit about who you are, um, where you fit into this world, what you've been working on, and how people might be familiar with your work. Yeah. Well, I am a mom to a three-year-old <laughs> and to a kitten. I am <laughs> Which if that a, kitten scratches at the door. It, she's it, coming uh, in. No, she's, okay, she's just, I'm going to, not only that, I'm going to go get her halfway through. <laughs> do it. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm also um, uh, a wife to my husband Zach, and uh, I, I I like to lead there just because the the I used to lead with with my credentials, right? You know, this is what I do, and, and like I'm just so over all that now. <laughs> proud of proud of the work that I do, but proud of the person that I am first. Uh, but as it relates to the work that I do for the sake of today, I am a, a proud to say I'm the author of nine books. The ninth book now is um, Happy Days. Yeah. 42. I wrote nine books. I feel pretty good. Um, getting a lot done in this lifetime. Um, so nine books, Happy Days, The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace is my latest book. And um, I have been a motivational speaker for 20 years. I'm That's my art, speaking publicly. I am the host of a show called Dear Gabby, podcast called Dear Gabby, which is so fun to do. And I, you know, do a lot of other things in my life. Love to cook, love to exercise. I love, love the sauna. Gabby cooking show. I love you know, the show. I, I've been like really de on the down low for the Gabby cooking show. I got to bring it back in the biggest way. Um, but yeah, and I love to take saunas, which is like another <laughs> thing that I'm addicted to and obsessed with. So it's a little bit about me. Well, I can't believe that many books like that's that's um, bonkers. One of the things that I loved about, um, you know, I've we've known one another for a number of years and have a lot of this similar friends. And yet every time um, a dear friend of mine puts new work out there in the world, I try and devour it, you know, pre-order the book and just check in. And in that process, in advance of our doing the show today, um, there was a line in your bio that captured my, uh, captured my heart, but also my brain in, as it relates to the show. And that line is for, for over 16 years, Gabby Bernstein has been transforming lives, including her own. Hmm. 
And so that's where I wanted to start our conversation today with this idea of transformation and specifically the difference between transforming it as in individuals doing the work, you, you Gabby versus sitting outside and prescribing. Mm -hmm. So, and, and to get one level more specific, what are the ways that you feel like you have transformed your life? You opened, you know, this most recent book, happy days with the story of sitting in your car. Um, so that might be a place to start, but yeah. How, how, in what ways do you look at your own life as a transformation? And then we'll shift gears after you answer that question into, and what is, what are the key ingredients for helping others transform theirs? But start with you first. Yeah. I think about the girl that is in the car in the first chapter of this book. I don't want to give too much away because the stories are good. It's a good book. <laughs> They're good. Really, like it's a They're movie. Page Definitely. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I said to my therapist, I'm like, who do you think is going to play you in the movie? Because um, <laughs> she's a big character here. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm in the I'm in the car and I'm listening to the this cassette tape. Yes, I'm I'm talking about like <laughs> almost 20 years ago, <laughs> um, 17 years ago, I guess. And I'm sitting in this in this beat up white Toyota Corolla, and I keep replaying this one message coming through from a psychic reading that I had had the you know five or six months prior. And I I'm I'm hung over in the car, and I haven't slept the night before, and I'm adhering to alternate side of the street parking rules. So I'm sitting there just waiting for the street cleaners to come so that I can go back into my apartment and crash. And I just keep listening to this this audio over and over and over. Rewind the cassette, press play, rewind, press play. And the cassette audio is the voice of the psychic saying to me, you have two choices in this lifetime. You could stay addicted and that's not going to be good. Or you can get clean and make a major impact on the world. And I keep repeating this audio over and over and I keep rewinding it and listening to it and rewinding it and listening to it because in that moment, I can't contemplate what it would be like to make a major impact on the world. I can't even contemplate what it would take to get out of bed that later that day. But I listen and I'm, and I'm continuously returning to that prophecy that there is some other life for me. And that was a, a very big point in my decision to not stay addicted, to not stay in the repetition of behavior that was going to kill me and to choose a path that would indeed make a major impact on the world, but but most importantly, make a major impact on my nervous system, on my psyche, on my ability to be a human in this lifetime. So this is a book about transformation. I have spent the last, I mean, really, I say like it took me forty-two years to write this book <laughs> because it's a, it's a, it's a, sto it's a, it's a life story of, 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 of transcending the traumas that we pick up along the way. And how do this, other people do that? That was the follow-up question, right? How do other people? Yeah, do that? that's um, and that's that's like, and maybe we don't have to do you know the all of the different steps because your book is, serves that purpose. But what, where's a good place to start for like for you that was a recognition that you you know needed to get out of the party scene um that might be something else for someone else so how 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 do we identify where's the where, what's the start for someone who's you know on a treadmill right now or sitting in traffic or on the subway mm -hmm. listening to this and because you know my hope is that there's a there's probably a smaller distance for most people between where they are and where they want to be to get on this path. And so where ought they look to start? That's a cool concept. There's actually no distance at all. It can happen right here, right now with you and me while you're listening. It's all about your willingness, your willingness to choose a different path. You could literally be sitting here with us right now, having a quantum shift, listening to Maybe you've never heard my voice before, 
but you're going to have a quantum shift with me right now because you're looking at your life and you're saying, well, it has to be better than this, or there has to be a gentler way, or I need a miracle. And that statement of any kind, there has to be a better way, is enough to begin the journey. It's enough to have you keep listening. It's enough for you to pick up the book. It's enough for you to go listen to another podcast with Chase. It's another, it, it, there's just invisible doors that will open for you when you become willing to change. So that's the first step and it starts right now. So here we are. We, we, we hooked our listeners. We're like, all right, I'm, I'm signing up for more. So we, we turn a few pages into happy days and there's the, the, the chapter, the first chapter is about freedom and are you open? Are you willing to become free? And the second chapter is about bravery. Now it's not an accident that there's, you know, that step one is sort of the desire and step two is bravery, right? Because this is not, this is not easy work. Mm -hmm. So when faced with the idea of doing hard work or staying on the couch or maybe something less sort of aggro than that, just staying in the status quo, which is sort of like a bad relationship, right? It's, is it bad enough for you to leave or at what point does it get bad enough for you to leave? Because when it's good, it's okay. So, you know, help, help gear us up for we're going to do the work. We're going to do this work with you, Gabby. What, what ought we expect? Yeah. Well, there's something that you're mentioning that I think is kind of interesting. I often look back on be, being a drug addict and, and I was a cocaine addict, so that's pretty rough. It's a rough one. And I can look back and be like, I'm so glad I was a cocaine addict and not just like, you know, a casual drinker because it brought me to my knees, which made it easier to be brave because there was no other choice. I mean, there was another choice, which was death, frankly, you know, but if I wanted to live, there was no other choice. But for that person that's just on the couch, it could be even a little bit harder to tap into that bravery because you're kind of like, well, it's okay. I'm not going to die from this. You know, I'm not going to die on the couch. So I just want to acknowledge that some of us that have the privilege of hitting a really hard bottom, it might even be easier to become brave enough to change. For those of you out there that are like, well, I'm in this relationship and it's just not really serving me, or I'm in this job and it's just taking me down, or I'm in this old pattern, I just want to change it. I guess the question you'd have to ask yourself right now is, what are you going to do with this one life. I'm like quoting Mary Oliver right now, but like, what are you going to do with this one precious life? And when you ask, that's a brave question to ask. Mm -hmm. And the bravery can be scary to contemplate like, oh, how can I face the, the dark corners of my past? How could I possibly go to the places that scare me? How could I feel into that feeling of inadequacy or being unlovable or whatever it is that you may not even be able to have words for today? But the bravery comes with the desire. So like you said, we start with the desire and then we move into the bravery. And it also comes with the faith that there's a better way. And so throughout the book, I think one of the greatest spiritual messages that's com consistently infused throughout this book is that there is indeed a gentler, softer way. And while this is a book that touches on a lot of therapeutic practices, it's a spiritual book at heart because there's no way I could have come from where I was to where I am today and stand and sit in the seat right now of this grace without having that spiritual connection by my side. So with bravery comes this faith that you can free fall. And to trust also that if you're reading that chapter, or even if you're listening to us and you've continued to listen, that there's a part of you that is willing to jump, is willing to take that leap. And to trust that there is grace on the other side and to trust that in this book, I will guide you, that I will really gently and compassionately be there as a source of love as you carry through the journey. And that's actually my biggest intention of this book 
is mm. for any human who recognizes the traumas in their life, traumas with a big T or traumas with a small T, we're all traumatized. Any human that wants to feel better, any human who wants to heal the past, that they come to this book and they feel the infusion of my self energy, my love energy coming through to act as a conduit through which they can take this brave step towards recovery and towards healing. I, I want them to feel as though they have my presence and my guidance by their side. That is a an amazing intention. And as someone who, I, I mean, just to tell you guys how much of a page turn this is, I'm reading this thing via PDF. And if you've ever <laughs> read a book via I, PDF, like you got to really want it. And it's, it's, it's excellent. I can feel your guidance and your presence. Um, I, um, let's touch on trauma. I mean, it's in the subhead and I think it is for good reasons. The, the phrase, uh, in part due to you and your work in part due to, um, I think the zeitgeist starting to understand the concept mm -hmm. of trauma. <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. uh, so, you use the phrase, you know, throughout the book and here just a moment ago, you know, capital T trauma, little T trauma, and yet that we all have it. Now, for someone who um, this this word might be new or the concept might be new or someone who might be experiencing some resistance right now, like, no, no, I'm, you know, my childhood was fine. I got along with my parents and we were a cute, sweet, little happy family. I mean, just, just set the stage for trauma and maybe, you know, dabble in both capital T trauma and small T trauma, but let us know mm -hmm. how we all have it. <laughs> Please. We all have it. We all have it. You can't be alive right now without having experienced trauma. You know, you can't be sitting um, in March 2022 and your government says go home and you're, you're like, what the fuck without having some kind of PTSD. You just, you just can't. The PTSD of living through a pandemic of fear, living through the divisiveness of these times, living through the horrific visions and images that we see on our daily screen. You can't live without experiencing trauma today. Now, the big T traumas versus the small T traumas really are based on how much our nervous system is affected, mm. how repeated the behaviors, the experiences were. Um, and most most importantly, to point out how much recovery we ha recovery we had on the other side. So typically, when we have trauma as a child, whether it be sexual abuse or violence or uh, a, a really divisive divorce or feelings of, um, of of not just just not being cared for, neglect, okay, whether repeated or not, as a child, we would not necessarily have the resources to regulate and follow up with that experience and heal from that experience. And so ultimately it becomes a neural loop in our brain and we stay in this consistent state of fight or flight where we take the adult experiences in our life and we replay those childhood fears in every adult experience that triggers us. So s simple things can reactivate those childhood traumas if they are unresolved. Small t traumas, it's 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 still the same thing. We can have an experience that causes a energetic disturbance and it can continue to replay and repurpose. The difference may be that it may just be easier to to move through. It might be easier to to undo. Um, but it's it's still present. And every method in this book will address big T and small T trauma the same way. That's you know, you, you, let's go back to something you said a, w a moment ago is like, it's almost, um, you're sort of presented with the, uh, awareness more clearly in the capital T trauma as you were with say cocaine addiction versus sort of lightweight ongoing low grade stressors or partying a little bit too much. And so for the person who may be uh, doesn't have a lot of experience with, with, uh, capital T trauma. Is it fair to say that this small T trauma might be sort of as damaging or potentially as, um, insidious because you're not aware of it? And I guess I'm trying to get people right now who are, you know, we, I believe that most people are, who are listening are aware of their own 
history and can point to things that have had a dramatic impact on them, use the, the concept of affecting their ner ner nervous system. But I also believe there's a whole cross section of people who are still closed or resist the idea that that doing work is is not for them or they don't need it or and and I'm trying to open those doors. So give give me some tools to be more articulate here and or mm -hmm. just take the stage and help help people understanding or who are listening who might not say, okay, cool, this is I, I like Gabby's work. I I I I'm fine though. I'm I'm good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um wherever you are in your journey, whether it be identifying a small T trauma or a big T trauma, we have to come back to the place that you're at right now. Because right now, whether you know about it or not, you can't really identify the problem unless you're willing to look at it. So I'm I'm sorry, but I'm coming back to willingness. Yeah. Uh, or that you're safe enough to even recall it. Because in my case, in the book, I talk about remembering childhood trauma that was dissociated, right? So you may think like, oh, a small T trauma might be, you know, harder to recognize. Well, actually, sometimes big T traumas are so hard to recognize because they've actually been dissociated from. We 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 literally can forget because we leave our we our soul departs or we leave our body in the moment. Our brain has a beautiful capacity to dissociate so that we do not have to feel that suffering in that moment because if we may not survive. So in my case, I just checked out, for, but my body remembered every single day. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the same, whether you are completely dissociated, whether you're in denial, whether you're anesthetizing that trauma, whether you're avoiding, whether you're totally aware of it, but just unwilling to look at it, no matter where you are with whether it's a big T or a small T trauma, you have to recognize that it is wreaking havoc in your life. And it is affecting your your nervous system. It's affecting your sleep. It's affecting your gut. It's affecting your skin. It's affecting your your ability to problem solve. It's affecting your parenting style. It's affecting your sex life. It's affecting your relationships. It's affecting your decision making skills. I mean, it's it, each of us have different ways that trauma that trauma shows up, but it's a disturbance. It's an energetic disturbance, and it's an inability to be present. As as uh, Peter Levine so beautifully says, trauma is the inability to be present. Mm. And so, if you're someone out there and you're like, I don't really think I have trauma, and I don't really want to think about this or talk about this, then, then you know, buy the book for your friend, <laughs> or you know, <laughs> go read one of my other books on manifesting. I mean, that's fine. They, you got to be willing to look, no matter how big or small it is. If you want to read this book right now, I'm not saying you have to. You could go through your whole life totally just like, I don't want to deal. And I'm going to, you know, stay on the couch and I'm going to drink and I'm going to date, you know, messed up relationships and whatever. Or, you know, just coast. That's fine. Do whatever you want. This is a book if you want to go big and you want to recover and you want to come out the other side, you want to experience. If you want to wake up without anxiety every day, this is your book. So that was a powerful line too. Do you, I think that may have been from the intro, but just this idea of waking up anxiety free. It's a very common, you know, when I take questions from this community, either, you know, on the podcast or any at a live event, the idea of waking up with anxiety, you know, you talked about the images that proliferate in our news and, you know, sort of a very unsettling time that we're experiencing right now, pandemic, political, uh, you know, economic, lots of reasons to feel anxiety. This idea that everybody, not, not everybody, but it sounds, it feels like everybody, this is a very, very popular question. So <clears throat> this concept of waking up, if we use this as an expression of freedom or, you yeah. know, helping deal with this, you know, our traumas, when did you, when in your recovery process, did you begin to awake anxiety free? What do people have to look forward to? For me, it was, well, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to be disappointed by this, but it was about three years ago, two and a half years ago. <laughs> <laughs> seven, seven books in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, you know, it was like eight books in. Um, 
but but that's also because so much i listen i don't think that we wake up overnight without anxiety but when we make a commitment to do this type of work and to look more closely to shine light on our past to shine light on our wounds to work, do therapeutic processes with with the therapy that is right for us to be on a spiritual path to take care of our energetic system we have so much grace along the way. So while I didn't wake up one day and it was gone, yes, I actually mean that, that has that has been what's going on the last few years. I don't have anxiety every day. I don't have anxiety. I don't have fear. I don't I live with a lot of faith. But along the way, I experienced countless miracle moments of up leveling. Mm. And many experiences that were even re-traumatizing but were perfect because they were part of the path. So when you can look at your life and say, oh, I can see why all that happened or I'm grateful that that fucked up experience happened to me because I'm now where I am today or because I learned that transformational lesson that has brought me closer to God or closer to my partner or whatever it might be, then you then you really are living this life. Then you are really getting you know squeezing all the juice out of it. Because you are truly committed to seeing through the lens of love, seeing that if you are in the pursuit of grace, if you are in the pursuit of inner freedom and that's your goal, then no matter what happens along the way, you're good. And I it's can the process, really process can, not the end product sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I share in this book. Yeah, I got clean and sober 16 years ago, but how much more did I share in this book of what happened after that? You know, of remembering the trauma of um like total suicidal depression from postpartum depression, just a lot of tough stuff that I had to face. But I look back today and say, whoa, thank God all that happened. And I wanted to happen again. But thank God all that happened. Why do why why are why do so many of us feel stuck in patterns that make us unhappy? What's the what's the neurology there? What's the what's what's Gabby's explication for why most people feel stuck in patterns that make them unha unhappy? Mm -hmm. And what's what's your prescription? Well, it's fear because the the pattern is a fear response. The pattern is a way of numbing that fear. The pattern is, I, I, I'm trained in uh, internal family systems therapy, and I uh, have a way of explaining this that I think would be really helpful. So we have these protector parts of ourselves, and you, you called them patterns, right? I'll call them protector mm -hmm. parts. Okay. So it could be the, you know, picking up the girl, the part of you that picks up the drink, the part of you that uh, sleeps in pa way past when you should, the part of you that stays in the bad relationships, the patterns, as you referred to them. Mm -hmm. And those protectors, those protective patterns, those protectors are perfectly placed to avoid ever having to face the impermissible feelings of fear, the exiled feelings of fear from our childhood, the exiled child parts. And so those protectors are on high alert at all times. They are ready to rumble. They are going to swoop right in the second that that fear part starts to get triggered Boop, there comes the protector. I'm going to control the shit out of everything. I'm going to, you know, fight back. I'm going to pick up a drink. I'm going to yell. I'm going to, whatever it is, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to check out. Those protectors are in place and they have been in a repeated extreme role for what could be decades and decades and decades for many of us. And the repetition of their behavior becomes a neural loop. It becomes a pattern in our, in our brain. And the undoing of that pattern must happen by focusing on those parts, by befriending those parts, by helping those parts recognize another form of safety, by establishing enough love self-energy, as we say in IFS, 
so that we can become the leader of our systems, that we can really be the witness of those protector parts and that our higher self, our resourced self, can bring them back to safety, can help them step down and help them get out of their extreme roles. But the thing is, those patterns or protectors, whatever you want to call them, they are, they're not bad. They have a very valuable, important role. They've kept us safe for a very long time. The cocaine addict Gabby was not a bad part. She did the best she could. The controller Gabby, you know, she's no longer in her extreme role. But you know what? She wrote nine books in 11 years. Okay. There was some good that came out of her. So looking at the patterns, if you want to call them patterns, the bad patterns, you know, or I, let's call them protectors for the sake of this IFS conversation. And let's just call those protectors by their name. They're protecting us from something that we are not yet ready to face. And when we become safe enough to face those parts and become willing to do the work, then we establish enough safety to start to allow those protectors to step aside or to step down or to be less extreme. Did that make sense? That was wicked. Oh, amazing. Like good. That, this, this is sort of, well, that's part of what I'm seeking to do with the show and have been for now a dozen years, trying to unpack the concept of a willingness to do work on ourselves as you know, if you talked about identity early on, like desire, the, the, the identifying these things, and that this willingness is no longer, um, it's no longer taboo to acknowledge a part of you that was a protector, because that part of you developed in order to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And you know, this idea that we all have trauma, capital T, small t, and you are not responsible for that trauma, whether it was child abuse or rejection or neglect or any of the long list of traumas that we all have experienced. But as an adult, you're not responsible for that, but as an adult that you can take responsibility for your own healing. And in fact, it mm. is a, it is a, an incredible journey and one that you have documented in all of your books so profoundly and vulnerably. And for that, I thank you. Hmm. You that that is your superpower, right? Your ability to be vulnerable to talk about loving uh, Gabby, the cocaine addict. So thank you for that. Hmm. I have to. I need to keep pulling on this thread, though, because there are, you know, you you in the book we realize that you've done work on a bunch. You know, you just mentioned IFS. There's just you know talk therapy. There's so what are the tools for someone who's, whose interest we may have peaked here? Like, okay, cool. I'm down to do some work. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a world where seemingly we have more tools than ever before, access to those is obviously all over the, all over the spectrum based on socioeconomic status, based on uh, willingness, based on, you know, family, custom, cultural awareness. W Talk about the range of things that you've used um, and maybe give some advice on, on how to ferret those out. Because in a sea mm -hmm. of choices, right? It's like if like, mm -hmm. you walk up to, I hate those restaurants and there's like 11 pages. Yeah. Just give me a one sheeter. And yeah. so what's our, what's our one sheeter to get started on this oh so valuable internal yeah. work that you've written about? So, you know, I, I wrote this book to to vulnerably share my experience of transforming from trauma and becoming free so that other people could recognize themselves in my story, no matter how different it is, because there are similarities in all of us. But, but most, but, and then also to give someone the sense that they're not alone and that they have this guide by their side, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. But then the next intention is to introduce my readers to the spiritual therapeutic processes. And I start with spiritual because every therapeutic mm -hmm. process that I write about in this book is a spiritual practice. It was, it was like God given to the people who brought them forth. And, <clears throat> and they're also very rooted in, 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 in spiritual faith, in, in my opinion, you know, in my interpretation of them. Though they may, though they're widely used in the clinical space, they're very spiritual practices. So I share through my recovery journey what my experience was of returning to the body through somatic experiencing therapy or 
befriending all of my parts and and letting connecting to self through internal family systems therapy and getting out of the fight flight state through EMDR eye movement desensitization and reprocessing through uh, I talk I talk in this book about um, just so many uh, even spiritual and meditative practices that are designed to help you self soothe. I yeah, share tapping a chapter, and releasing yeah, your tongue. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm at that right now. That's a yeah. really interesting way. Well, that that's that chapter on connecting to your body. Yes, the body chapter is really profound and helping mm. you recognize that your psyche and your body are not separate; <laughs> that it all is interconnected. And the end of the book, I even go as far as teaching some of the parenting methods that I've learned from Dr. Dan Siegel. And applying them to ourselves in a chapter I call the reparenting chapter, bringing these Peppa, methods. Peppa Pig in. plays a exactly. Role, yes, <laughs> yeah. There you go, babe. It's so nice to have these beautiful readers that really care. Um, and my my hope is that while I've had the financial abundance to have the privilege to practice these principles with experts, while I've had the privilege of being in the field of personal growth and you know like having like the best people on speed dial, you know, um, I want to acknowledge that and call that out because someone listening is like, screw you, Gabby, you know, how could I afford to do this therapy therapy and this one and this one and have all. So a big goal of this book is to one, give you tools that you can apply right now, you know, methods that, that you can safely attune to and use on any given day to start to regulate your nervous system and calm yourself down. And to also throughout the book and in the resources that I offer with this book to really show you that there are real human angels out there doing this kind of work at very affordable rates and in some cases with you know for free and in some cases for you know just just trainings that you can get from me for free or whatever it is that you are guided to that there is help that there is help but you know we have to and and also that that investing in that help you know, like, sure, would I have loved to have spent all the money I spent on therapy on like handbags or something? Yeah, probably, you know, <laughs> but different I kind of therapy. <laughs> exactly. But I wouldn't change. I would, I mean, I, I've, that investment is the greatest investment of my life. It's the greatest financial investment of my life. Let's talk about that as a concept of investment, because I, I do believe that that resonates having, you know, had hundreds of guests on the show and spoken to, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And the idea, when I say, would you like to invest in yourself? I have yet to have anybody say, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I think there's a genuine desire to do work. What, you know, when you think about the resources that go into that, you talked about, I would, I love to have had that money to spend on handbags. Yeah. So there's money, right? There's um, the time that it takes to read books and listen to podcasts. And there's, you know, it's, it's easy to look at all, everything it takes. But what role does the heartache and the pain that that, that process uncovers? That's what I think people don't want, Right. I'm like, I'm willing to throw down some money. I can, you know, get, you know, join Gabby's inner circle for, for, you know, free or for, you know, uh, a monthly stipend or I can do all these things, but how much of this perpetual people say yes, but don't do it is because it's going to hurt. Oh, I mean, it's, it's all of it. Right. So we're coming back to the parts of us, the parts of us that sign up but don't follow through are protectors, right? It's like, nah, I don't really want to. I, I, I want it, but like, I don't want to go. No, once it gets want too- Want with a small W, right? Exactly. If it gets too squirrely, if it gets too scary, it's like, I'm out. I'm out. You have to trust your system. You know, you have to trust your system's willingness and, and steadiness. And there's times in life when we are, when I remembered- my experience of being abused as a child, when I remembered that in therapy, actually I remembered that in a dream and then it came out in my therapy session. 
I asked my therapist, I said, why did it take me 36 years to remember that, you know, like why or however long, I mean, it was it happened when I was young. So I was 36 when I remembered. Why did it take, you know, 30 something years to remember this? And she said, well, because you're safe enough now to remember. Your system is safe enough now. I'd had decade of therapy behind me. I had her support. I had my husband in in that in that attached connection. And, you know, so it was um it was the safety in my system that was able to go there. So we don't go there until we're ready to. And so trust your system. Don't force it. And all throughout the book, you you know this, you've read it. All throughout the book, I say over and over, come back to this chapter if it's activating. Do not do this now if this is too much for you. Remember this in 10 years if it's, you know, whatever it is, because some of it is just not right right now. You know, I spent decades just, you know, performing for my therapists straight up like let me tell you all the great things that are going on in my life and they would just sit there like literally like when am i going to break through and then the breakthrough was like a busting through so it's not for nothing if you feel like you're just sort of like going through the motions that's enough right now mm -hmm. even the small steps are enough right now yeah this uh, i have a concept of no effort is ever wasted like you said you needed to you know, hit rock bottom in order to have it present itself as a problem that need to be solved or uh, if indeed that's true, no effort is ever wasted. Were there any signs that you're getting close? <laughs> because I think most people want, we want an easy fix. And what you're hearing from this podcast right now is it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick. So <clears throat> is, that the, is that the right way for um, us to think about it? I mean, well, it's not, let's look at it like this. It's a lot more difficult to sit in your discomfort and live in your discomfort and live in the perpetual patterns of chaos that we create. That's much more difficult. So what I mentioned earlier, the grace along the way, you're not mm. going to wake up tomorrow without anxiety. Maybe you will. You could have a quantum shift. You absolutely could. But you we'll wake up tomorrow maybe after listening to this podcast and downloading the audiobook later and listening to the first chapter waking up you may wake up and be like hopeful or you, you or you may be like you know curious that feels better than than stuck yeah so each step along the way leads us up that ladder of that emotional scale as abraham hicks lovely talks about you know, the emotional scale of just getting out of that depression and getting out of the hopelessness into a better vibration, to a better, a better belief about our possibilities. And so, well, yeah, you may not be like perfect overnight. Each step that you take towards your own personal growth is a step towards a better vibration, a better, a better feeling. And so you will feel relief along the way. Which which of these steps, personal question here, which of these steps was hardest for you? Hmm. Um, the period between- And hard, hardest, I always hate when I get asked, like, what's the most, the best? No, no, favorite? no, I can, no. I can so, really answer this, yeah. Okay, okay. Good. I mean, because there's really so much tough stuff along the way, but like my drug addiction and alcoholism like was nothing compared to remembering trauma. Like nothing. It was cake. Remembering, remembering childhood sexual abuse at the age of 36 sent me back into it. I was walking around kind of re-traumatized, having flashbacks and dreams. And that went on for a few years. I mean, it really went on hardcore for at least a year. And then I did a lot of EMDR, which is really soothing to the system when you, when you have a uh, recollection like that. I would really recommend EMDR for trauma. But that was the toughest, the absolute toughest time. My my gastro issues just were at an all time high because my body was just like so inflamed from the memories. I had like gastritis and then SIBO and it was just constant. I was like a hundred pounds. It was just, it was a really horrific time in my life. But even in that horrific experience, I actually felt some hopefulness because I had some answers now. 
you know, I could look and say, oh, well, that is why I was a drug addict. That is why I live with so much fear. That is why I'm so controlling. That is why I became a workaholic. That is why, 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 why? The answers to the question why were now there. So it was horrific and difficult, but it was also relieving. Yeah, this, the human brain, we often need whys, right? We need the answer. We need a, a rationale to go on. And this discovery of this, this aware, that's one of the reasons I like, becoming aware of a problem is is the first step in in managing and i feel like you used the word just a second ago that i want to linger on and it's an idea that i would like to close the show with today and it's you use the word hope and what what role did hope play in your personal journey and what role do you think hope will play to the listener who has decided today to take the first step or maybe the, you know, 800th step, but to keep going, what role does hope play and how do we cultivate this idea of hope? I mean, the book is called happy days, right? Mm -hmm. That this is a hopeful title in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about hope for a moment. Hope is a vision for a better future and we cultivate hope when we have the desire to see things differently because with that desire comes answers the universe is always responding to us whether it's coming back with a yes for something we don't want or yes for something we do want and when we start to say in our own ways, through prayer, through intention, through thoughts, through through just showing up and listening to a podcast like this, those are messages to the spiritual presence within us and around us that says, yeah, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to change, I'm ready to... And when we make that kind of statement energetically or, or literally, we open up these invisible doors for hope to step in because that vision of a different future, that acceptance that things could be better, that slight, as they say in the 12 steps, the mustard seed of hope is enough. The slightest, slightest bit of hope is enough because it keeps you curious. It keeps you aligned with a God of your own understanding, a spiritual connection of your own, keeps you coming back. If you were free from fear, who would you have the freedom to be? That is the question that your book, I think, does an excellent job of helping us come to our own answers. Congrats. Again, Happy Days, The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace. What number is it? Nine, 11, 26? Nine. 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 <laughs> I'll come back at 10. We'll have a party at 10. <laughs> we'll right. be in person for 10. We'll it's, be in person for God. 10. <laughs> Please make it so. Please make it so. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, and congratulations. I, this community is really good at supporting authors buying their book during Pub Week. It's a thing that we know and practice together as a community, so uh, I highly encourage it. Again, I read a 108-page PDF 106 page PDF. I'm getting a hard cover out to you to like, <laughs> yes. write this minute. First of all, I just want to acknowledge you uh, for all in front of all of your listeners that you, know, you go, I go on a lot of podcasts and not everybody reads the book, you know, not everybody reads the book. And it's so meaningful and it makes for such a beautiful conversation when somebody has experienced the content. And I, particularly with a book like this that is so vulnerable and took so much of my heart and soul to put out, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for mm. taking the time to respect the work and to to show up the way you did today. It's, it makes for a really lovely conversation. I just adore well, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will graciously accept and and also say I enjoy your work deeply. It's so well timed as we were, you know, chatting before we started recording. It just it seems like this, you know, the awareness of the trauma that we all have experienced. I think you used that word ten years ago. It doesn't land, and um, now there are we have new profound examples with the the pandemic and shifting of culture, and uh, it's it was. I'm sure it was no small undertaking. Um, 
So thank you mm. for doing the work and putting that work out there for us to consume and share. Uh, where else would you steer people? Obviously, you know, check out if you can get it from a local bookstore. Great. Otherwise, Amazon or any of the other online will we'll be able to deliver Happy Days, The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace. Uh, comes out in February 22. So if you're listening to this, you're going to be listening to this the mid-February. But at any time, you can hop in and grab it. Where, though? Would you steer people outside? I know you have a bunch of programs through your own platforms. Give us a, a you know a ninety second tour of where you'd steer people to outside of just your news book. The best place where I can be a resource for people right now, if you're like, oh, you know, I can't get that therapist, or I don't know, I just want to dabble, I need a little bit of help, is on my podcast, Dear Gabby. On Dear Gabby, I, I workshop people and they come on and I just riff and take them through different topics and different different stuff that's up. And it's where I can use the tools that I have applied in my own life that I've created, that I've learned and really support others. And so you'll recognize yourself in my my audience and the folks that come through. And it's it's a beautiful place to get to get that free counsel and guidance. And so I would probably just say, go listen to Dear Gabby right now and just let me love you up. Sweet. Subscribe. Thank you so much, Gabby. Good to catch up. Um, congrats on the, the book and on so many of the, your other successes. Um, thanks again for being on the show. You're always welcome here. Every time you got new work out, we, we'd love to love to have you. So thanks again. And Thank uh, to everybody else out there in the universe, uh, I hope you have an incredible week and signing off until our next time together. Gabby and I bid you adieu. Thanks, man. Thank you.